I'm Srivatsa Krishna. I'm an IAS officer currently on a leave of absence doing my PhD. Jairam, uh, the great thing you've done is to bring environmental intervention back on the national agenda from the clutches of the DMK, which was viewing it more as an extension of the Mint in Pune. Having said that, there's a very serious belief now spreading amongst people in the country that environmental intervention is rapidly moving towards environmental Talibanism under you. I'll give you two examples. You spoke of implementation of the law. Mrs. Gandhi took three years through a very extensive process to declare what was a reserve forest and what is not a reserve forest. There were public consultations. Teams went on the ground, inspected what was called forest, and then they were declared. Under environmental Talibanism of the Ministry of Environment today, anything which is recorded, and I've seen it with my own eyes, as Chota Mota Jangal Ka Jhad is classified as a reserve forest by your people. That is not implementation of the law. Number two, the go-no-go -go policy, 40,000 megawatts, 2 lakh crores of investors' money is stuck, and power projects are not coming. Foreign investors are terrified of now coming into the country because of this. Isn't there a middle path which you can choose? And I'm willing to take a bet here with you in this, in front of this audience. Now that it has gone to a GOM, it will not be a no, it will not be a yes, but it will be a yes. So if that is indeed going to be the case, why are you starting off with this in the first place? Why can't we have a middle path between environmental realism and environmental Talibanism? Uh, shall we take a few questions together? Yes, someone there. Uh, yes, you. My name is Karthike Sharma. I am from Law College, Dehradun, uh, from the state of Uttarakhand. I have in front of me a photocopy of a letter that you sent to the Chief Minister dated 6th of January 2010. It starts with Dear Dr. Dr. Pokhriyal Ji, something, something, something. I think you shall remember. This is about the ghats in Ajitpur and Misarpur, about some saints who had who were on a hunger strike till death. Do you remember, sir? This is about that. I personally went there. I visited all those sites. And let me tell you, sir, things are going from bad to worse in Uttarakhand. Uttarakhand is the state that is the source of the Ganga and the Yamuna. Uttarakhand is the state that is responsible to feed the Indo-Gangetic plain in a nutshell. And Uttarakhand is the state that does not have an independent Question, water please. policy. Ma'am, this is very important. If yes, I, I, I agree. I cannot do this in a question. Please. So if everyone is willing to listen, because this affects the entire country. Uttarakhand is the source that feeds the Indo-Gangetic plain, that feeds your sugar bowl, that feeds your wheat bowl, and that feeds your politics. Now, if you do not take care of those rivers, if you do not take care of those glaciers that feed those rivers, you will not be taking care of yourselves, you will not be taking care of your politics, we shall not be able to wear these clothes and come to these fancy conclaves. And this will not happen in 10, 20, 50, don't forget about those figures of 20, 50, 20, 100. This will happen very soon. I request soon. you to be short, please. I, I, I would love you to go away. on, this is a subject okay. very close now to my, my heart. Question, okay, the question to you, sir, is, I will give you this project, Please take this project with you when you go along. The question is, will the ministry, the government, whatever, I don't care about who does what, will you do something or not about the state which is responsible for the water security of one, if not the whole country? Will you do something about that or not? Do I go home and tell them? What do I tell them? Okay, next. My name is Madhur Pajaj. Uh, Mr. Jairam Ramesh, uh, I believe that what is bleeding India is not your nose. Uh, <clears throat> what is bleeding India is the procrastination, the delays. <clears throat> if it has to be a no, and uh, I endorse what you said in your speech, because we don't want India to be a desert. But so many projects where thousands of crores have been used up are just languishing because there's no decision. Please say yes, no, yes, if, whatever it is, but quickly so that we do not lose time, we don't lose labor, we don't lose money. Thank you. Yes. Uh, this is one of the best dissertations on convincing me that the world has an environmental problem. But all you, you have talked are about the symptoms of this illness, in my opinion. The moderator, with due respect, talked about the population of Singapore and Hong Kong. These are micro places. I think 
that while you're addressing this huge problem of the environment and its symptoms, the real core of the problem is the population growth. Let's talk about Your question, it. please. That's the question. Oh, that's the question. Are we addressing okay, the you. population or not? Uh, 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 yes, Sir. Rahul. Mr. Minister, uh, the terrible nuclear accident in Japan has sent shockwaves all across the world. Germany and even China have already put on hold their plans to expand their nuclear power generating capacities. The government of India hasn't felt a need to do so so far. Do you not think till the time we understand fully the ramifications of what happened in Japan and whether we can control a catastrophe of a similar nature, should we too not do the same? And given the fact that there is so much opinion building against nuclear power, is there not a need for India to reassess how much dependence we want to have on nuclear power? If a country like Japan with its technologies can't deal with the catastrophe of this nature, how will India ever expect to do so? And I add Vipul Mishra's question from Allahabad, which came on the website. Uh, it says, how far is India prepared in case of natural disasters of the Japan kind? Okay, can I take that? Yes, please. Okay, let's start with the Japan issue, because it's, you know, the least easier. that hits home to me. Yeah, easier. Uh, yeah, it's easier to deal with, you know. <laughs> now, in so far as the Indian nuclear program is concerned, just about 3% of our electricity supply right now comes from nuclear energy. And under the most optimistic of projections, we were expected to double this contribution by the year 2020 and go up to about 13 or 14% by the year 2030. Unlike Japan, where nuclear contributes about 30% of electricity, electricity supply or other countries like France or even China for that matter, which has made major investments. Now, I think in the wake of what has happened in Japan, which is clearly the most advanced, most disciplined, well-engineered society in terms of safety systems, certainly this is the time for us to pause, to look at our safety systems, to look at the state of our preparedness for dealing with unforeseen emergencies, catastrophes in the coastal areas. But I, for one, cannot envisage a situation where India uh, should say now, here and now, unilaterally, that we are going to put a complete ban on the use of nuclear energy. I think that's an unrealistic position to take. I think the position that has been taken is that let us look at our safety systems, let us learn from what has happened in Japan. Let's certainly get from the Indian International Atomic Energy Agency and the US Nuclear Regulatory Commission all the information, both on the reactors and how the response took place. And if there is need for additional safeguards, if there is need for improving the institutional mechanism for dealing with safety-related issues, radioactive waste management issues, certainly we should make those, we should make those improvements. But I think if you're asking me whether India should say here and now that in view of what has happened in Japan, India is abandoning nuclear power as a source of energy, I think I'm not prepared to say that. I'm prepared to go to the extent of saying, let's be cautious, let's be prudent, let us understand that there will be major improvements required because if this has happened in Japan, look what might happen in India. And therefore, let's bring about all those structural changes. I think that type of hard-nosed review is called for. I would, in fact, even go one step further. I would say that if in Jaitapur type of a situation where Jaitapur is not a nuclear plant, it's a nuclear park, you have 10,000 megawatts of nuclear capacity uh, like we had in, in, in Japan. It's a large concentration. Maybe we should have a relook at this policy. Should we have such large concentrations of nuclear power of 10,000 megawatts in one location? Or go back to the old idea of having dispersed sites where you have 1,000 megawatts or 2,000 megawatts? Maybe that could be certainly one issue that will be thrown up as part of this re-evaluation. And I hope that this issue uh, will get the attention that it deserves. Many people have raised the issue of the Atomic Energy Regulatory Board. In fact, I find from your list of speakers, the former chairman is, I think, member of one of your panels. Uh, you should ask him this question. Many people have raised the question that in view of the 
huge expansion in nuclear capacity, does it make sense to have the Atomic Energy Regulatory Board part of the Department of Atomic Energy? Let me tell you, the Commissioner for Railway Safety in India is not part of the Ministry of Railways. He is part of the Ministry of Civil Aviation. Because in spite of 40 years of effort by the railways to catch hold of the Commissioner of Railway Safety, successive governments have said, no, we need an independent body looking at railway accidents. Is it the time for us to relook at the very structure of the Atomic Energy Regulatory Board? I think these are issues that will occupy uh, policy attention in the wake of what has happened in Japan. Uh, I think all the, uh, on the Uttarakhand issue, let me just say that I share the concern that the manner, the haphazard and indiscriminate manner in which the water resources of Uttarakhand have been allowed to be exploited is a matter of concern. It's a matter of social concern. It's a matter of ecological concern. The Bhagiriti, the Mandakini, the Alaknanda are all rivers that are seeing a spate of projects that have been on the anvil. And thanks to uh, you know, uh, activists like Madhu, who played a very important role, uh, I indulged in an act of environmental Talibanism uh, in Uttarakhand and stopped a project and started uh, many for more. which, of course, she applauded me and then forgot the applause subsequently. Uh, because you but started we, many more. Oh, we, stopped, we stopped a project, going by my young friend's uh, own example, we stopped a project on which 40% expenditure had already been incurred, on which 2,000 crores of money had already been spent by a listed company. And we stopped that project because it was the considered view of all experts, including the activists, that this would completely destroy the ecosystem from Gangotri to Uttarkashi. That was not an act of environmental Talibanism. That was an act of far-sighted sagacity on my part. People had so, to go on know, hunger strike no, no, me, you had repeatedly. Your you had your say. Let me finish my say. Yeah, so on Uttarakhand, on, on Uttarakhand, on Uttarakhand, I share the young man's concerns. It's a very complex issue because already water has been bid out. Large number of companies have already started putting the projects on Bhagirathi, on Alaknanda, on uh, Mandakini. Now, the reason why we were able to stop the project on Bhagirathi was because of the government project. So government took a hit of 2,000 crores. Whereas in many other areas, these are private projects on which money has already been sunk. It's going to be a difficult issue. We are carrying out we are, we are conducting the carrying capacity studies. We are trying to put as many projects on hold on which work has not started. But where work has already started, I think that will present us some very difficult choices. And if we say no to those projects, of course, I'll be accused of Talibanism again. Now, the third issue on population, you know, as I said, even if all of India, if the Hindi belt today, if UP, Madhya Pradesh, Chhattisgarh, Rajasthan, Bihar, Jharkhand, where somehow, by some miracle, achieve Kerala-type population growth rates next year, India's population would still be 1.6, 1.7 billion by the year 2050, 2040-2050. We're still going to add 400 to 500 million people to our population, irrespective of what success we get in the North Indian populist belt. So that is the magnitude of the demographic challenge that we are confronted with. And I think environment policy has to respond to this demographic challenge. I think the fourth question that was raised, uh, nuclear I've answered, population growth I've answered, I've answered the Uttarakhand issue. Uh, the Taliban, yeah, let me answer the Taliban issue. Well, first of all, it's very clear that Srivatsa is not going to get a job as long as I'm minister in the Ministry of Environment and Forest. <laughs> <laughs> Srivatsa is a young man whom I have known since he was, I don't know, 10 years old. I've attended his weddings. He's had lunch in my office. He's a young man. Once upon a time, considered himself my protege, but no longer. <laughs> so anyway, I take his remarks in good spirit. I take his remarks as reflecting a certain degree of frustration. But I need to remind you, Srivatsa, that in order to deal with the, precisely the issue that was raised by Mr. Bajaj here, take some decision, for God's sake. Don't put everything into cold storage. We have taken those decisions. Some of those decisions have evoked a response from you on environmental Talibanism. 
And when I took a decision to give Mr. Verma sitting right in front here access to iron ore mines in the richest sal forest of India, the Sarinda forest, the entire environmental community accused me of being a Taliban of a different type. You know, of ensuring that the forests of India are being destroyed, the elephant habitats are being destroyed, water sources are being destroyed, but I did it for, for, you know, for, for sale. So I am not phased by what you said, Srivatsa. This is the nature of this job. It's a thankless job. And as long as I'm in this seat, I will exercise my decision-making authority in a transparent and accountable manner. People will criticize me. I'm open for that criticism. The same person who gives me bouquets in the morning will give me brickbats in the evening. The example is sitting right next to me. I am quite prepared for all these contingencies. <laughs>